Turn your Bibles to Proverbs chapter 22, verse 6. See, now I'm catching myself on YouTube. I was like, I do this, so I'm going to do this now. <laughs> Let me give you a, a, an introduction as we get into this. Ch- you know, children are our future, <clears throat> and, and we really need to invest in them. They really are. Now, I say this in a spiritual way and not necessarily you know, in a worldly way. Uh, though the children are our future in the world, you know, they're the ones that will become the next presidents and Congress and Senates or political leaders or, or doctors or lawyers, you know, to help society or engineers and architects and so forth. And that's true. But also, in a spiritual sense, they are to take on the baton and uh, really take the gospel message to the next generation, to those that are born lost. And without Christ. And they are born lost and without Christ. Uh, there are children now that are born and being raised by families that don't know Christ. And these children are growing up not even hearing the name Christ. Even in our generation, when my kids were younger, we had a neighbor and I shared with her about Jesus. And she literally asked me, well, what house does he live at? She thought that he lived in the neighborhood, you know. So they were living without Christ. And thank God that we were able, through the kids, uh, having relationships with them, and then us having relationships with them, we were able to minister to them, and the kids got to see the gospel go out to them. Um, Virginia and I went over to their house, just a really quick little story. We went over to their house to discuss our kids' relationships because they had a problem with us not letting our kids go to her house but she was allowed to come to our house because we were very protective of our children. And so uh, they wanted to meet. And so we met, and the Lord turned it around, and the whole family got on their knees and accepted Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. And then they were actively involved with uh, in harvest and so forth till the Lord moved them away. So those are the opportunities that you get to see and, and watch your children invest in, and the Lord just gives you the fruit of it, and it's awesome when you see something like that happen because of the, the light and the salt of Christ in the lives of, of you know, your children and so forth. So let me read to you a scripture, Proverbs 22, 6, and then I'm going to show you also one in Ephesians 6, 1 that we'll turn to. But let's start in verse 6 of Proverbs. Now, the Proverbs are written by Solomon. Solomon had the greatest wisdom of all that God had given him. And the Proverbs, when you read them, they're really not, uh, they're, they're not in a contextual form. They're little sayings or thoughts of words of wisdom and so you can't really find the context within a chapter so forth you've just got to so that's why they're so hard to interpret and what they're really trying to say so you can take a verse and you just have to kind of dissect it and try to you know pray about it and through the holy spirit see what the lord is telling you looking at the hebrew words and and so forth so here we have a a, a proverbs in verse six train up a child in the way he should go And when he is old, he will not depart from it. Yet there's more of his love for us to experience. So here Solomon talks about children and having all the wisdom in the world. And I'm sure that he had children. He had a couple of children at least uh, that we know of, if not more. Uh, He saw and he noticed certain things about children that you literally had to train them up. And you had to train them up in the way that they should go. And that when they got older, they would have the same wisdom from that training and they would not depart from the training that you implemented in their lives. Now, this is also a New Testament teaching. Paul takes this wisdom of Solomon and he applies it to children also. So turn your Bibles to Ephesians chapter 6. And we're going to look at verse 1. This is in the New Testament. The New Testament interprets the Old Testament. And so Paul is giving the validity to uh, Solomon's writings and that this is a, a, a word of wisdom that comes from the Holy Spirit. And because it's written twice by the Holy Spirit, it's something that we need to really adhere to and, and listen to. So Paul says in verse 1, and we'll just read down to verse 4, Now, in the epistles, they're instructional, right? The epistles are instructional epistles. They're always instructing us on how to live the Christian life. And here, Paul is instructing us how to be good parents, how to be good children, how to be good wives and husbands. And so he says in verse 1, Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and mother, which is the first commandment, with promise. Now, when he says with promise, you go back to the Old Testament, the promise was that you would live long. 
if you obey your father and mother. Because there's wisdom there, especially godly parents who are guiding you spiritually in the right way and not to do dumb things. I don't know if you, you heard the news, but this last Sunday, a girl was drunk driving Sunday morning and she got on the wrong side of the freeway and she killed six, six people. Six people. Now, you could assume that her parents didn't teach her right or she was in rebellion. We don't really know. But if you train your children right, they won't get into alcohol. They won't get into, uh, apparently she was under the influence of marijuana also, from what I read too. So uh, things like that. They'll live long. And it's sad that, that not only she was in critical condition, but her life, but the lives of others. There's always repercussion for sin. Always. Always. And it's sad. So with the promise that it may be well with you and you may live long on earth. And you fathers, do not provoke your children to wrath, but bring them up. Now the word bring them up in the Greek means to nourish up to maturity. To nourish generally. Now as I share a little bit tonight, there are not a lot of scriptures pertaining to children giving you an outline you know, on how to raise them up exactly in every scenario and situation. And so a lot of it is applying the whole Word of God, truth, you know, from lying to cheating to stealing, to character, to stewardship, all of this that kind of gets snowballed into uh, a tool that you can use to raise these children. And so you're not going to find the scripture that just spells it right out for you. It's just impossible. The world will tell you there's no manual. Well, the manual is the Word of God for us. We read the Word of God. We gain wisdom in every part and aspect of life, and then we apply it to our instruction to, to children. And so we're to nourish them in a general sense as they're growing up in life itself. In the training, now that word training can also be interpreted discipline. Training, discipline. You think of the word training, an athlete. It also takes discipline to train that athlete. And admonition of the Lord or instruction of the Lord. You know, there are many parents who are afraid to discipline their children, to train their children. They're afraid to lose them as young children. And so they get the idea that they need to be the children's friends. You know, we're, we're friends. You know, don't look at me as your parent. You know, I'm more your friend and we're going to be friends and so you can tell me everything that's going on and, and I'm going to be your friend and we can confide in one another. And, and they try to go that route so that they don't lose them because they're afraid that uh, their children will turn against them and think that they really don't love them because they're correcting them or training them or disciplining them. And, and you can't do that. Your primary concern should not be for them to like you at this moment. Your concern should be in 20 years when they come back to you and say thank you for training us. So that's key number one. Your children will not like what, what you do. They will not like your discipline. They will not like your correction. They will not like your training. Uh, they're made that way to rebel because they're learning. They're growing. They're experimenting. They're testing grounds. And so you have to stay the course and, and teach them the right way as they're growing up and be stern about it. You can love them, and they'll see that love later on down the road. I think it was my, my son Simon, who later on, after going to uh, Cal Poly University, um, what came to my wife and I and said, thank you for training us all those years, because uh, if I had not had that training, the professors at the university would have uh, swayed me to leave Christianity. And so it works. And... and as they get older and as they get kids, they will thank you for being stern, for setting guidelines, for setting boundaries and so forth. They'll appreciate it. They may not right now, as teenagers especially, and that's usually the age that doesn't appreciate it, is from 14 to 18, they don't appreciate it. And so just, just acknowledge that, accept that, that's just the way it is, but, but keep those boundaries there. Let's break this up a, a, a little bit more. Now, both Paul and Solomon use the word train or training. So we're to train up the child. Well, what does that mean? <clears throat> are we to force them to believe this way? Are, are we to live our lives through them? You know, things that we didn't do as, as children or things that we missed out on? Or are we pushing our children to experience those things because we missed out on them? 
or is is what the Holy Spirit's saying here is that we need to look at each child and we need to understand their personality and their differences, their gifts, their ideas, their visions, their dreams and so forth and we need to take all those things and we need to help them to fulfill those things in a godly way. We need to be stewards of who they are and who God made them to be with the gifts that they have and help them to achieve those things if eventually it's something they want to pursue later on down the road. Because, you know, obviously they have dreams, but those dreams don't always come true in, in, as they get older and they change. And that's okay. It's not a big deal. So what we need to do is we need to train them not necessarily the way that we behave and our habits and our characteristics and so forth, but train them in the way that God had made them. And so understanding their differences. You know, I had four boys uh, and then one adopted son and every single one of them were different than each other. They were all different, completely different. Uh, ones were very aggressive. Others were very shy, very quiet. Some I had to discipline more than others. You know, the, this, the, the belt to the seat of understanding had to be applied there, you know, and so forth. And yet others, I never even had to take a belt to them. All I had to do was say a word, and they knew they were in trouble if, if they didn't change their behavior. And so they're all different. Uh, I never really pushed my hopes and dreams on them. In fact, um, I always told them that I really don't care what they do in life. What I do care about is that they get to the other side, that they go to heaven. And I can remember one day sitting at the table and talking to my children, and I always took the opportunity to talk about spiritual things when we had supper together. I'd either throw a question out there and say, hey, what do you guys think about this? Throw that question out there, and we would discuss that question, get their ideas. And then I would correct their ideas according to Scripture. And I remember telling them, as you're getting older, you're going to pick occupations, you, know, you have careers, and it doesn't matter what you do, you can be an architect, or you can be a mechanic, or you can be, you know, a gardener, I don't care, when I die and I go to heaven, I'll be at those gates, and I will be waiting for you, and I want to see you go through those gates, it doesn't matter what you do in this life, what matters is you get to the next life, and I made that very clear to them, you know, uh, that they're all different, two of them were in tennis, the other two, one was in polo, the other one didn't do anything athletic. He just liked to drive around in a little red Miata, you know, looking good. I won't tell you who that was, but you could probably guess. <laughs> so fathers are to, uh, you know, to guide and to correct their children. They really are. That's your responsibility. That is your role. You know, you listen to them, and then, then you direct them. You know, you guide them and you say, is that really right? Is that what Scripture says? Is that what God wants of us? You know, and you correct them so that they understand. See, we need to train up our children. We need to tell, tell them things are wrong or things are right. That's how you train them up in the way of the Lord. It's kind of like a ship's captain taking a uh, vessel, you know, and he, he controls that vessel with the, uh, the rudder, you know, and he just guides it and leads it. It's still going in the, in the right direction, but he's got to guide it and lead it every so often. Well, what's our training manual? We're to use the Word of God. We're to take this Word, and we are to understand it first. We need to read it and understand what God says, and then we need to use it to train up our children. Now, now here's, here is a big, big benefit for us as believers is that when we are training our children up, we have a higher authority than us. And that's God. And so, when we train them up, you make it very clear to your children that God has said this. It's not me saying it. God has said it. And I also am under the same principles. You stole something from the store. God has said that is wrong. It's so wrong that I can't even steal something from the store. And so if, you can't, if I can't steal, you can't steal. Because God said it's wrong. And so we're both under, under God's hand and under God's rules and guidance. And so it takes the pressure off of you. You know that, that your mom and dad are always setting these rules. No, no we're not. And you know that it's God who set the rules. You know, love and do whatever you want. Right? 
We're to love God with all our heart, mind, soul, strength, love our neighbors, ourselves. If we just loved the way we should, then we could do whatever we want. Because we wouldn't do what would hurt someone else. Because that's not love. And so if you could teach that to them, that God has called us to love, so let's love one another. Let's forgive one another. Let's accept one another. And, and we can get along. But it's God telling us those things. So understand that when you set up these rules and so forth, just say, God has told us this is how we live in this household. Second, it says, in the way he should go, in Proverbs, and then Ephesians says, the admonition of the Lord. So notice that we are to train up our child in the way that he should go, but not in the way that he, that his dad wishes him to go. You know, we are vulnerable to that. And so we, again, we need to be careful of that. Now, parenting is not so much about molding as it is about unfolding those characteristics in your son and those gifts that God has given him. You know, show him his duties. Show him dangers. Show him the blessings. Let him fail. You might even see him failing. Let him fail. Let them fail. And then correct them afterwards. Teach them those lessons. Uh, give them direction. You know, how to perform those duties. How to escape dangers. How to secure blessings. You know, how to read the Bible. I'm going to talk about some of the things that we did in our family in a moment, but I just want to kind of define these two verses for you a little bit. So is this important for us? Yes, it is, because they're the next generation. Your children are the next generation that will be pastors and teachers and in the church and serving so that the kingdom of God can continue on if the Lord tarries and doesn't come back soon. He may be coming back real soon, but if He doesn't, we need to prepare our children for the kingdom of God. And so I hope you understand the importance of that. I know the Jewish people did. And in Deuteronomy chapter 6, it tells us that we are to train our children up. You know, we should talk about the, the Word of God while we're walking, while we're sitting. You know, put the frontlet. They would put Scripture on the forehead. They'd literally tie a band with a little box and put, put the Scriptures there. Now, we're not to do that, but we're to keep it in our minds and bringing it up when we get opportunity. Very important. Because this world wants to sway your kids from Christi Christianity. In fact, there is is definitely within the universities um, a purposely driven agenda to remove Christianity from your children. They they say statistically anywhere from 89 to 94 percent of Christian children that go to secular universities lose their faith because of some of these questions like you saw with the debate on atheism and evolution and so forth. But they've also proven that when you compare Christian children to worldly children, Christian children are far better off than worldly children. There was a <clears throat> leaflet that was made by the Houston Police Department. It was called How to Ruin Your Child. And they used to pass these out. And it said it was guaranteed to be 99% effective. In part, this is what it said. Principle one. Begin with infancy to give the child everything he wants. That's not true. If you spoil the child, if you give him everything he wants, then he will grow up thinking that he deserves everything. And he won't understand how valuable things are. You have to purposely not give your child things. In your mind, and this is what I would do, and I think it's scriptural, is that you would train them by not giving them things, not allowing them to have things, even if they're okay and they're not sinful, but just to train them, okay, mom and dad said no. And so I have to accept that. They're my parents. You know, they're in charge of me, and so I have to accept that. They might not accept it at the time, and, and more than often they didn't. But then afterwards, tell them, you know, we don't always get everything in life. Now, I would purposely bless one of my sons in front of the others. You might say, well, that's cruel and mean what you put them through. No, no, no. Look, look. I'm purposely blessing him, showing grace and mercy upon him. And the others are just sitting there going, oh, that's not right. And then I take that and I say, wait a minute. Why are, you, why are you upset? Why are you angry? The Bible says, rejoice with those who are rejoicing. Weep with those that are weeping. Why aren't you rejoicing that your brother got blessed? See the attitude? It's a wrong attitude. Correct it. Because you didn't get something... You're upset that he got it, and so I would flip it around from time to time, you know, to teach them, you know, don't covet things like the Bible says and so forth. 
And they learn that. They learn that. Principle two, they say, when you pick up bad words, you know, they laugh at them. How many times you see parents using bad words and then you see the children using bad words? And then when you see on YouTube or, or Facebook, whatever, and these kids use bad words and the parents are just laughing with them. Can't do that. That's accepting it. And that's in reinforcing that bad behavior of cursing. The Bible says don't curse. Don't use coarse gesturing. Don't take the Lord's name in vain. These are all biblical principles. And so teach your children you don't cuss. Swear words should not be coming out of your mouth as children or as adults either. A sure way to ruin the life of your child. Principle three, never give him any spiritual training. Let him wait until he's 21 years old and then let him decide for himself. How many times have you heard someone say that? You know, I've heard it many a times. Well, I don't want to push my religion on my child. I'm going to wait till they're old enough and they can make their own decision. Well, guess what? The world's pushing their religion on your child. <clears throat> you know, <clears throat> your family members are pushing their religion. While you're not looking, your family members and your mom and dad are wrong. You know, you shouldn't believe in Christianity. <clears throat> the school is saying the same thing that you should receive uh, same-sex marriage, and there's nothing wrong with it, you know, and that God accepts it because God is a loving God. And they're lying to Him. They're lying to them. So you need to train them up now. You really do. You have to show them what's right and wrong because kids don't. You need to show them. Look, <clears throat> kids don't know that, that at a certain age that fire burns, right? They don't know that. Uh, so they're curious and they want to know. And so as they're approaching the fire, you stop them and you smack their hands, and, and it's okay, smack their hands and let it sting a little bit. You're not going to kill them. Let it sting a little bit. And they're like, oh, why'd you do that? That's fire. It will burn you. They don't know that. You are now training them. And now the next time they're going, ooh, that's fire. That will hurt when I go towards it. you know. And they won't go towards it. And as they grow up, they realize that's fire. It will burn me. Now that makes sense why my mom and dad told me not to go that way. you know. So that's how you train them in right and wrong. By telling them, explaining it to them, and disciplining them so that they remember it. You need to train them in the way of the Lord. It doesn't stop at toddlers. It doesn't stop at teenagers either. You know, it doesn't stop there. Teenagers, wow. <clears throat> Fourth principle, I've just got a couple more. Avoid using the word wrong. It may develop a serious guilt complex. How many times have you heard that? Don't ever say they're wrong. You know, because then they're going to feel guilty. No, you're wrong. The Bible says you're a sinner. I tell my boys that. You guys are all sinners. There's no righteousness in you at all. You know, and then explain it to them what, what that means. But then we're God's children and He loves us and He died on the cross for us. His blood was shed for us. You know, and explain that aspect of it all and so forth. You know, but you need to tell them that they're wrong. That's part of training. Um, doesn't make any sense, these, these people that uh, write these, these psychological books on parenting when they themselves never even had children. I, I remember years ago, Dr. Spock, who wrote a whole book on child rearing, and yet he never had one child himself. You know, Just amazing. It's amazing. Last principle, pick up everything he leaves laying around. So he will be, oops, so he will be uh, experienced in throwing responsibility on everyone else. Right? And that's what happens. You pick up after him. And so he learns not to pick up after himself. No, that's not true. It's a sure way to destroy a child by just leaving them to themselves. Leaving them to themselves uh, will destroy them. No, you need to teach them to work. You need to train them on how to work in this life because they're going to have to work later on down the work road. Now, if we apply godly principles, there's a promise with it. God gives us a promise when we apply those principles. And he said, when he is old, he will not depart from it. Depart from what, though? Some have used that phrase in that scripture and said that when he's old, he will come back to the Lord. That's not what it's saying. That's not what it's saying. What it's saying is he will take the wisdom that you have and he will come back to it. And he will have a choice whether to apply it or whether to ignore it. But more than likely, because he sees your life personally, he sees your characteristics and so forth, he will definitely apply it to his life because he sees it works. Because it's real in your life, first of all. And so there's a promise there that, that as they get older, that they will thank you for it, in a sense. Now, 
we need to look at uh, what the Bible says about parenting. As Ephesians 6, 4 said, the admonition of the Lord in the training or the discipline of the Lord. It's of the Lord. It's in the Scriptures. And we must go to the Scriptures and we must teach God's truth. You have to have a daily devotional with your children. And I don't care how old they are or how young they are. You need to at least sit down with them Open up a Bible, and if it's even one verse while they're younger or a chapter, that's fine, but have a daily devotional with them. And then close in prayer. We would oftentimes pray with the boys before they went to bed every night. We'd all gather together, and we would pray together, and they'd all go down to bed. And, of course, Virginia would spend hours with them, getting them to bed while I went to bed, you know, and that's her job. And then we'd also have devotions, you know, every night. We'd go through the Word of God. And so something that you need to do so that the Word of God gets in them, they see the importance of the Word of God, it's part of your life, and so as they grow up, it will be a part of their lives. Parents must must lovingly discipline their children because they are immature and they need guidance. Proverbs 22.15 says, Foolishness is bound up in the heart of a child. That's just fact. Children don't have the wisdom yet. They haven't the experience, and so there's foolishness in their hearts. And so we need to discipline them, as Proverbs says. Parents need to uh, make wise decisions and and bring blessings to their children. Parents who are godly uh, teach their children to obey. Teach your children to obey. That's important, that they learn to obey and not be disobedient. Because down the road... They're going to have choices to make when you're not around. And that choice will determine their life, whether they obey God or whether they do not obey God. Parents who faithfully train their children can be confident that their efforts are not in vain. And as we said, when they're old, they will not depart from it. Let me give you some personal experience on training children that have worked for us. Now, I don't claim to have you know, the right rules for everyone, but this is what worked for us. The evidence, I think, is is clear. Uh, All four of my boys uh, know the Lord, and they serve in ministry. Uh, And when I say that ministry, we were just talking about that today, um, ministry is everything you do, from training your children to loving your wife, uh, to going to church, to giving. That's all ministry. Everything is ministry. We're all in ministry. All of you are in ministry because you're Christians. So understand that. You're all in ministry. Uh, not only do my boys, but also all my grandchildren are in church, and a lot of them actually serve in the children's ministry, even at the young age that they are, 14 and lower. And so they all know the Lord and con- have confessed the Lord, and all the way, I think, down to Ethan, they've been baptized, and we're waiting for the other, the other uh, five to get of age and make that decision. Toddlers. Toddlers. The best years of, of, of the whole child raising is, is toddlers to, to eight or nine, ten years old. It's the best years of all. Um, that's the time you just pour your heart and love into them. The, the, the feeling, the touching, the hugging, the kissing, you know, the playing you know, around. I mean, that's when you really just, just get close to them. I did that. Virginia did that. <clears throat> I could remember every one of my sons being on my chest when they were little and sleeping with them, and I missed those days. And I remember just cuddling them up and just feeling so close and so in love with them. You know, tiny little boys, and now they're men. Now they're men. And as I go back and I think of those times that I just laid with them for hours and I touched their noses and their eyes and their eyebrows, you know, and just caressing their face and making them laugh and jumping on them and squeezing them and and so forth as toddlers. That's the time that you really just pour yourself into them and that love that you have for them uh, and touch and feel. That's important for them, for the children. Very important for them. So that they feel accepted, they feel wanted, they know who to go to and so forth. Now as they continue to grow up, that's good that you continue to do that. Because I did that all probably all the way till they were teenagers and then all of a sudden... You know, it just kind of changed a little bit. Now, some would say it shouldn't have. and Maybe they're right, but it just changed for me. Uh, as they were men now. And as a man, you know, I'm kind of like, you're a man now. You know, you're, you're a grown-up. 
And so this touchy-feely, lovey thing, you know, is not as important to me anymore. Now you have responsibilities and so forth. So at those toddler age, age when they get old enough, you know, give them a Bible. Even if it's a play Bible, a plastic Bible, but let them touch it. Read it through their little stories, small and short and, and quick. But they're in the Word of God. And, and then as they get older, more stories. Get them plugged into uh, the children's ministry and just various things like that. Uh, teaching them right and wrong, and then teaching them to do things, teaching them, no, that's wrong, yes, that's okay, and it's just training them all the way. Now, as they get up to 8, 9, and 10, again, precious years, tell them stories. <clears throat> they love stories. I guarantee you, if you just sit with them and tell them stories, especially biblical stories, and even if you take some of the biblical stories and, and, and just expound on them or even um, add some things to it, just your own little flair, they love it. I don't know how many times with my grandchildren, and even my boys, I used to tell them a story that my dad told me when they were little. I don't even know. Do you guys remember those stories that I told you when you guys were little? Probably not. But I used to tell them a story about a king who had a tree that grew diamonds. And um, <clears throat> how one day this eagle came by and plucked a diamond off the tree, and the king said, we've got to stop this eagle. And so I shared this story with them, and they were... Every night, they're like, tell me the story, tell me the story. And I'd only give them so much, and they'd anticipate the next night, you know, to hear more of the story. And so I'd always give them a little more, and a little more, a little more. And so I learned that with them, and with my grandchildren, especially girls, it was always the forest with the king and the knights, you know, and, and the horses and so forth. And I, I'm telling you, they'll come jump on my bed, Poppy, tell me a story. I want to hear the story. And I'll always leave off, so that next time, like, continue on from here. And then I'd have stories just for them, that I wouldn't tell the others. And so they're like, you didn't tell anybody. Oh, no, it's your story. Okay, good. Let's start. You know, we're here. They were going in the forest. It was black and dark. And, you know, what happened next? You know, and, and so we'd go on from there. They love stories. And again, it builds your relationship. You know, it gets you close together. And then you can also teach uh, biblical principles while you're telling stories. Now, you might think, well, I'm not a storyteller. Believe me, they don't care. And they won't notice. All they want to do is spend that time with you. And even you make a few exciting little points. You know, they're like, oh, you know. And you know what it points you need to make to make them go, oh, really? Is that what happened? You know. And then just stop. They're like, oh, oh. I'm like next time, okay, okay. You know, and then they get them excited. You know? Boys and girls are different, <clears throat> so you have to treat them differently too. Um, Ethan is a lot different. My boys were a lot different. A lot of wrestling, a lot of fighting, you know, because they're men, and I think that that's good to train them that way. Girls are different. They spend time with mom. They spend time in the kitchen. They spend time folding clothes and things like that. You're just teaching them about life. And then they get into that, that teen area, you know, 13, 14 to 18, and things just change. Now, devotions are still continuing on, and your discipline is increasing. <clears throat> with more severity. I'm talking about the Proverbs that says that you are to you know, discipline your child uh, with a spanking and a whipping. And so if they deserve it, and it's deserving, do it. And I don't think there's anything wrong with it, but do it in the right way. Always on the butt, because God created the butt just for that. I really believe that. There's so much cushion there that it's not going to damage or harm your child. Be careful of hitting them and slapping them anywhere else of the head and things like that. Don't do that. Now, I did that once in a while, you know, and it was wrong, and you shouldn't do it. The hand, again, when they're little, but I think as, as they get older, the hand doesn't even work anymore. And I think the butt is the best place to do it. I remember with one of my sons, I, I had to get the belt. And, um, I mean, these are teenagers. I'm not going to tell you which one it is, but you probably guess anyway. Um, <clears throat> and he did something wrong, so I said, okay, get to the room. And I said, get on the bed, assume the position, and I got the belt, and I just whack, 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 and always three, you know, whack. <laughs> and, and I looked at him, and I said, okay, so don't ever do it again. And as I turned around, he said, that it didn't hurt. I'm like, it didn't hurt? <laughs> I'm like, okay. So I came back around, and I said, whack, whack, whack. Did that hurt? And his eyes are tearing up, and you're like, it hurt. I said, and, you know, and I told him, don't do it again. Don't do it again. And I think that was probably the last time that I, I had to spank him also. So you need to discipline them if, they, if it's severe enough. Uh, 
that it's going to harm them or it's really going to take them down the wrong road. You really need to do that. With teenagers, again, the devotions, um, sticking with the devotions, going through the Bible, through scriptures, but then now getting them active in church. This is so important that you get them active in church as, as teenagers. They can start doing things. They can start coming in the morning and help you clean if that's what you want them to do. Start anywhere. Do anything, you know, uh, but as long as they're in church and they're active in church because then it creates for them later on down the road the desire to be in a church and to participate in church and not just go to church on a Sunday morning, but to be active in church. And the church needs the youth to continue on in the church, definitely. Also teaching them responsibilities. You know, what is right and wrong, continue to do so, especially with girls, sitting them down, explaining all of those things, or boys, you know, and really letting them know that doesn't come until after they graduate, once they're a little bit older, and once they um, are mature enough. And that has to be made all clear to them so they understand that responsibility. I believe at that point, you start letting them make more decisions themselves, but you still guide and lead them. I literally got my boys together, and we went to a restaurant, and we said, we're talking about dating. So I want you guys to set the rules. You know, so they were, all they were, Modesto, I think, was in 15 or 16, around there. So from there down, and, and Roman was not a teen yet, but he got to participate. You know, he's like, I think they should not, not, not date at all. You know, he, he like doesn't care anyway. And the other one's like, well, okay, let's set a time, you know, and, and, and no dating. And if you, you do like a girl, you can't date them, but you can, you can kind of hang around with a group. And so they kind of participated in the rules, you know, and they were making those rules. So they were learning to make decisions and wise decisions along with you guiding and leading them. And that's important too, that you're watching them and they're making those decisions. Helping them to be hard workers and not lazy. Virginia and I, what we did when she was working, I was working, we literally came up with a whole agenda on the whole house. We took each room and we listed all the things that needed to be done with boxes and checks. And they all had their clipboards in their rooms. And they all had to do their jobs before they woke up in the morning. It was brush your teeth, comb your hair, wash your face, you know, put your deodorant on. Uh, <laughs> these are teenagers. Make your bed, put your clothes away. And then they could eat and go to, go to school. When they got home, the clipboard was there. The living room, make sure all, everything was picked up, dust on these certain days, vacuum on these certain days. And so they had all these agendas that they needed to do. And so the house and everything was clean. Everything was taken care of. And they were participating in that. They learned to be hard workers. They learned to work. I would take them outside and we would work in the yard. Sometimes parents don't even have their kids outside. They're like they complain, they want to play games and do so. Oh, I don't want to work. No, you get out here and you will work. And I would take my boys out there and we would work on the yard. We would dig trenches, we would dig holes, we would cut trees. Whatever it is that, that we needed to do, we would do. Sometimes I'd just leave them out there by themselves. Of course they have fun. And understand that. I mean, I remember one time leaving them out there and then throwing rocks at each other. You know, and not doing their job. And that's going to happen. That's going to happen. That's part of the training. They're still kids. You know, they're going to do silly things. So that's okay. But you go out there and say, okay, get to work. You know, do it. You know, take care of it. You know, and they learn the responsibility as they do all of those things. And then comes a day when, when they leave home. Now, I thought, for myself, I thought that... Um, I was going to be okay with that, you know, psh, go, mom and I are alone, you know, and I thought Virginia was the one that was going to be, not be able to uh, handle that, but it turned out it was the opposite, you know, she was like, go, and I was like, oh, because I loved my boys, Man, I loved it when they were toddlers, and I loved wrestling with them on the carpet, you know, and throwing them around, and and just having fun with them. And we even took vacations together when they were teenagers, getting active in their life, going to their sports events, you know, letting them know that you love them and, and you respect the decisions that they're making, those good decisions, and you're going to support those decisions. You know? And we did that. And so when we had vacation, when they were 15, 16, 17, 18, we all went to the beach, we all boogie board, we all enjoyed the restaurants, and we did it as a family. And it wasn't like they were doing their thing, Mom, and Dad, do your thing, and we're over here. No, we were united together. Because I really believe that's what God does. You know, when you put Him first, and He is the center of your life. And we made sure that that was first in our lives, was that God was first. 
and then we were second. So there's so much more that I'd like to share, but uh, I told you I'd get you out. So it's our responsibility as parents. Don't let the world lie to you and tell you how to raise your children. You raise them up in the way of the Lord. It may be difficult, but we're in the trenches. And it's hard. Don't give up. You have to keep at it. I used to read Dr. Dobson's books on raising children. I read most of his books. And then I would read other parenting magazines, Christian magazines, you know, on parenting. And I'd listen to certain radio stations that talked about it. And I applied it all. I, I took whatever it is they said as a believer, knowing they were believers, that these things were tried and tested and true. And I applied it. I applied it to our lives. And it works when we apply God's Word to our lives. So I pray that this helps a little bit. Um, there's a lot of information out there. As I said, you can not necessarily focus on the family, but family. Uh, just look up Dobson. He's got a new ministry out there too. I'm sure he's got a lot of resources too on raising children. So, All right, let's pray.